Well, my name is Javier, and uh, I grew up in, you could say, the Midtown area of Los Angeles. <laughs> what the? That's crazy. crazy <laughs> it's been a long time since I hadn't seen no tattoos man I got my first tattoo at, at a very young age I was 12 years old the first one it was an area code tattoo where I grew up at the 213 area code back then in Los Angeles majority was just considered 213 so it was like I used to see the older homeboys with that and I thought that was it. Like I need to, I need to put one on to myself and represent where I was born at, where I came from, my roots, my grounds, the streets I walked on. And uh, it was like one of the proudest days for myself, you know, like, oh, I got this thing. Now I'm part of like, I'm cool just like them. Family was important to me. You get me? Like I grew up with both parents and stuff like that. Um, I'm the only child between those two parents. But I do have stepbrothers and sisters, right? Um, two of my brothers that I really looked up to passed, well, they, one passed away, the other one went to jail real early when I was young as a kid. And uh, I used to look up to them, I used to hear stories about them and stuff like that. I used to hear what they used to do. Yeah, they were in gangs themselves, right? And what I could tell you is that me growing up in that area where I did grow up at, these were respected men, my brothers, right? So being that the case, like I was just a kid trying to be a kid before I got involved with all this lifestyle. I was just what you would call your ordinary kid, wanted to run around with my friends, play handball, football, baseball. And then it just became a domino effect, man. I would hear the stories from about my brothers and I used to look up to them even though I didn't know them, but just the respect they had, it was like, damn, like what a trip, you know? And all I ever wanted to do was just be a part of, you know, what was going on. I really didn't know the baggage that was coming with it. You mean? Like, I didn't know that getting myself involved in what I did came with luggage. And a very amount of large luggage, man. You know, it was just, my friends were doing it. I knew my brothers were involved in that, my sister. Being that I was a baby of the house, I was like, well, pretty much fuck it. It was what it was. Out of the little crowd I grew up with, there was two individuals that were the oldest ones. I got in at eight, these individuals were 13, right? Well, these two were like the oldest ones out of this circle. So they used to tell us about how they would go with the homeboys and the, and the females were there. They used to tell us about how the homies were giving them money, how the homies were giving them sacks to sell, how the homies were embracing them, how they went probably just to like Tommy's to go eat and there was like other enemies and they got down and fight. And, and we used to hear these war stories. And like I said, we used to look up to these individuals, right? These were the two oldest one out of the circle and they glorified it like, like in a movie. And it was like, are you serious? Like for real? Like what? Like, oh man, like, and the way they, they put it out there, pumped us up. Well, at least I'm gonna speak for myself. It pumped me up. And I wanted to be a part of that. It was like, I want to get the intention also, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to get that pat on the back. So there was a part of me that was fearful. There was a part of me that was like, damn, whoa, whoa. I really don't know. But like I said, getting that pat in the back, getting embraced, getting being felt like being a part of that was more important, you know what I'm saying? So I was willing to take a chance and just like, pretty much just ride with what had to happen at the moment, you know? And it was like, I did what I did. I got involved, I got jumped in into a neighborhood. I would play the role when I'll be at home. And like I said, as soon as I leave to school, like I'll go underneath the apartments, oh, pull out the big old 50s or 60s, slap them on. My homeboy showed me how to crease my clothes. 
My homeboy showed me how to like do this walk. My homeboy showed me how to like comb my hair to the back. Like I watched, I learned, I would ask. And it was like, I was just learning information from them. It wasn't the best information, but it was like, that's where my mind was at at the moment. So I was willing to learn anything they were saying to me. At 12 years old, uh, you know, I started messing around with like weed and alcohol at 11. Just fun and games, hanging out, laughing, the munchies, chilling. But uh, at 12 years old, I had a friend that introduced me to crack cocaine. And uh, I was willing, like I said, he told me, you gotta try this, man. Let's go hang out, some females. And uh, I was always a willing participant. Like I was a risk taker, like, all right, all right, you know? And so I started trying this stuff and it, it took me on a different level, man. Addiction took me to a different lifestyle. Where, like I'm involved in a gang and I'm heavily involved in drugs, man. At 12 years old, addiction took over my life, man. You know, crack cocaine took over my life. And, uh, I started getting more involved in, uh, in crimes. That's when my, uh, I started going into juvenile halls. By then, like my parents were trying to talk to me and uh, I wasn't hearing it no more. So from the age from eight to 12, that's a four year distance, right? From the moment I got into 12, now I've learned some stuff. Now I felt like I was a big kid, you know, in campus and um, I thought that they couldn't tell me nothing. I was those kids that, uh, would talk shit, had a bad mouth, um, didn't want to listen. You know what I'm saying? I felt like I had, I had somebody to back me up in case, you know? So I felt that power. I was with a lot of anger and frustration inside, like, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't show an emotional part of me in there. We just can't do that. So whatever hurt that I had turned into anger, and whatever anger I had turned into fist fights. And that's just the way we rolled in there. Like that's, that's, that's how we deal with things, you know? In other words, uh, the outside life gets cut off. This is where you're at. Either you're gonna program with this, this is how it's done, or you already know what the consequences are, you know? You're about to get stomped out and rolled out of here, you know? And it was just crazy to, to, to go through that at a young age, you know? But yeah. I started getting involved more in the streets and drug addiction, man. And it took me to a place that, uh, a very dark place at a very young age, man. Very young age. Dad, like, I'm gonna be a dad. You know what I'm saying? Even though he already knew I was involved with the gang lifestyle and drugs, like there wasn't so much he could tell me on that level, but he wasn't too fond of the woman that I had picked. And he told me, I remember when he told me, he's like, nah, not with her. So right there, that bondage between me and my father just broke. Like, I look at it like, you lied to me, homie. And now I couldn't bring no more problems at home to nobody. I felt like you guys are just bullshitters. And everything was to the streets, to the streets. I started like just leaving home, running, doing my thing out there. I'll go in and out, drug addiction. Like it just went full force. Like my life just changed, man. I thought that one thing I, I could depend on was just like, I'm gonna bring you this problem. Like I'm a kid, I'm about to have a kid. Like you always told me oh, you could help me. And it was just a, like a lie at the moment. So it just, the bondage just broke right there. And the saddest thing was that um, I went to the California Youth Authority for four years and I didn't get to see him be born. I wasn't able to be in the kid's life for a few years. Okay, so like around somewhere along the line, when I was in the California Youth Authority at 17, somebody introduced me to heroin in there, right? Mind to say, like, from the age of 12, where I started experimenting with rock cocaine, like, I tried everything, man, to 16. Like, I was just one of those little young kids that was an addict out there as a teenager, having fun, running amok, doing what we did in the neighborhood, gangbanging, looking for trouble, right? I had never tried heroin out here. I tried it in there. That, take, that took me to a different dimension in my life. Right there, that part right there was like, man, I found it. I found the one thing I cared, the one thing I loved for more than anything, man. I loved that stuff more than I loved my kids, man. That's how deep I got in tune with that, with that drug. And what had happened was that um, it took me to places I never thought I was gonna go. It was making me do things that I thought I was never gonna do for drugs, you get me? And um, so a lot of things started happening, right? I meet the next woman that comes into my life. 
which I have a child with, my little girl. And due to the lifestyle I had, again, I had to get incarcerated one more time based on choices. And I didn't get to see my daughter be born too. I remember being over ecstatic and now I'm a young male adult. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I'm gonna have a kid, man. Like, hey, it's for real now. Like, I'm gonna be there. Um, I didn't want to leave the hood lifestyle, but I did want to be in my little girl's, at least when she was born. At least I wanted to see what it felt like to, 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 for our kid to be born, to hold her, to hear her crying or whatever, you know? And I missed it, man. I did some choices and I missed it again. And, uh, and then what happened was two years and seven months ago, my daughter's mom was talking to me, man. We had a conversation. I was incarcerated, right? I had kicked heroin for like about, I want to say a solid month. I was real sick. I was coming down like I was hurting, man. And I, I got into this phone conversation and she got me at a moment where I was vulnerable. She got me at a moment where I was hurting. She got me at a moment where I wished I would have been outside in the streets instead of being locked up. Like I was just going through it, right? And she started talking to me, right, about what is it that I really want? And she gave it to me raw and direct. There wasn't like, baby, like, you know, I love you. I'm here for you. Like, it wasn't none of that bullshit. It was like, you motherfucker, like, are you serious? Is this all you fucking want? Do you like being locked up with men or what? You got a woman out here. I'll be with you whenever you want. You can have all these things. And you'd rather be locked up like that, like a fucking animal with men. And I was like, what the fuck? Nobody had ever talked to me like that. Mind to say, nobody had ever talked to me like that. And I had never let nobody talk to me on that level, right? Being that I was at the stage where I was at, I listened to it, right? And I thought about it like, man, she's giving me the spill about reality, about all the choices I made, right? And when we hung up, I remember looking around the dorm and I said, damn, I looked at everybody and for the first time I had a moment of clarity, you could say. I seen the same individuals getting up at the same time, programming. The same individuals running to the phone, stressed out at the same time, hurting. The same individuals working out at the same time because we had to do that by rules. The same individuals playing cards at the same time. And I was just like, is this it? Everything I ever done from a young age, to this moment, is this it? Like, this is my grand prize? Being locked up in a fucking cell for the rest of my life, man, like, and I really had to analyze that and think about it because I never looked at my life on that level, man. And right there, like, it was like, man, nah, I'm straight, like, because you could have put an individual like me in any prison, any yard, any county jail, any part of the streets, and I know how to conduct myself. And I can, I can survive. I'm a survivor. I know how to do that. I've been a product from Skid Road in downtown Los Angeles. Like, you know, I know how to fucking do 10 City. It was like, I analyzed all my life. I said, damn, 23 years of drug addiction, crack cocaine at, at 12 years old, stealing, robbing, stealing from my family. Cause that was the first victims always was my family. That was the easiest victims, right? So the family always came first, man. And then society. And it went from crack cocaine, crystal meth, man. Um, Sherm, acid. And then it's just kind of like, I would consider myself, <laughs> I would consider myself what you would call the, tra the, the trash can. Anything that comes, I'm willing to take. I just wanted to party, man. But like I said, like, um, it took me a long time to realize that I was even an, an, an addict or an alcoholic. I didn't think I had a problem. I just thought I partied a lot. That was it, you know? Not even me landing in Skid Row, I thought I had a problem. You could say that for the first, I mean, I prayed before. A, I prayed before a small prayer, like, like God, get me out of this one. <laughs> like, God, don't let them give me a couple more years. Like, uh, you know, like those, that, 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 that prayer that it's like, that, oh God, please get me out of something right now, you know? But for that first time, that night when I had that moment of clarity, I remember sitting back in my bunk and I thought to myself like, damn, I really asked him like, hey, if you can, man, like just sincerely get me out of this one, man. Like, let me, let me get out and I'm gonna give it the best I can. 
Sure enough, man, I didn't have court till like three weeks from that date, I remember. And like in two days prior to that, to the, to that day that I prayed, they let me go in two days. I was still in court fighting a case. A woman counselor who impacted me with the way she spoke to me. And that gave me like a turning point. Like it was like, what? Like she told me her story. And every time I would try to intervene, she'll cut me off. Like, no, it's not like that. It's like this. I started paying attention and my life just started like moving into a different direction, right? I started raising my hand in these groups. I started putting my input in these groups. Three, four months into that program, I came to, uh, to where I work at, at Homeboy Industries, and it was just like, right there, it was like, I came with a different mentality. You know, I asked G for a job and and, and I'm in this program and, and everything is through bus. I didn't have, a, I didn't have a, a car yet, you know? I'm staying with my baby's mom. Like, I'm just roaming everywhere. I don't know what direction I'm going to, but I know that I, like just being in that program and getting the job, like I knew something was happening right there, right? Because uh, I hadn't been to my neighborhood in four months. Three months into that program, I hadn't gone to my neighborhood yet, right? I hadn't gone back and gotten loaded. You know, and that was a trip. Because like I said, my whole life was involved with that. And so what happened was I started working at Homeboys and I started from the bottom and I just started like just following the rules, which was hard for me. So what I would do was like, I would get up early from my house. I stayed in South LA. I would come down here to Boyle Heights, mid Chinatown, with two homeboys, right, since early. So I'll be in the buses like five in the morning, get here, do my job, get out. At 12.30, I started part-time and go to Santa, to Santa Monica. That's where the program was at. And then by the time I was done with the program over there, by seven o'clock, it'll take me like two hours to get back to South LA. So I would be getting home at 10 o'clock at night. So, but my, you know, the, the beauty of all that was that I was busy all day. So I didn't have time to go to the neighborhood. I didn't have really time to, to go get high. Like I was just tired by the time I came home. Like I looked at it like, damn, I did a productive day. Like it was a trip. Like I thought I was like this hardworking man, you know? And, uh, but I was proud of what I did, man. I got in tune with GED at Homeboys. And um, this whole time that I was doing this back and forth thing, I was going to school right there. And in 10 months, I grabbed my GED at Homeboys, right? It's one of the proudest days of my life right there. I, uh, I remember they, they sent me that certificate home and I grabbed it and I went to Slots and Swami, man. And I, I asked those people that take pictures. I was like, hey, uh, you know, they had a little cap and gown and shit, right? I never walked the stage, but I was thinking that like, well, I'm gonna take a picture with this. I remember taking that picture with that cap and gown and I went to my mom's house and I gave it to her. I told her like, hey, I got something for you, man. And uh, she opened up, she looked at it, man. And like her eyes just got watery, like, like fuck, you know, like, but to me that was, that was good enough. Like, you know, I hooked her up. Like I did something good for her, man. Like I showed her that I could do it, right? So, and for me, what that did for me was prove to me that I'm smarter than what I thought I was. You get me? I thought that the only knowledge I had was street level wise, drug addiction, book study, no. So uh, it pumped me up to do bigger things, man. Like I just, I became full time at Homeboys. I completed that program in a year. I got myself involved in recovery. I just kept myself clean, kept myself sober. And I became a, a full time worker at Homeboys, right? And, uh, now what has happened in two years and four months that I got sober and clean in a solid recovery foundation, I'm a college student. I got my own place. I got my own little car now. I pay bills, I pay rent. I'm active as a father in my kids' lives. Um, I'm about to complete my first year in a community college, right? And just those things right there are a trip because uh, from coming from the lifestyle that I chose to live, and I say chose because I made that conscious decision at the end, from gang banging, drug addiction, skid road, to a productive father, a productive member of society, a taxpayer, 
to pay rent, bills, to go to school, to work. I trip out on that. I stay like, I, I stay in awe, right? Like, damn. Sometimes I gotta sit back and I look at it and be like, everything I went through was a purpose. There was a purpose for it, man. And my calling today is to help out the next individual in the same way, man, just whether it's just a simple hello, like, how you doing, homie? Because sometimes we don't even get that, you know? Like, I might be walking down the street and I see that people sometimes, like, move to the side, like, or grab a little purse or whatever, you know? And my intent, I'm just passing by, you know? But sometimes we don't even get that from the community, right? So I'm trying to be that member in the community where it's like, I look at them and I'd be like, what's up, man? Like, you know, just a quick check-in. That how you doing today goes a long way with an individual that has walked my walk, man. So it's a trip, man. Like, like that's kind of like where everything's at right now at the precise moment, man. And if it's one thing that I could say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go to a university like that. There's no stopping this. I got in a taste of life and it's not enough. Like I want more. That's my addictive behavior right there that's kicking in. Like this shit feels good. Paying rent feels good. Paying bills feels good. Being a father feels good. Working feels good. Getting up for a correct cause feels good. Learning feels good. So you know what? I want more. You know what I'm saying? And that's just what's been going on with me, man. Today I work as a mentor at Homeboys. We got a new grant where we're gonna start working with these youth kids that are coming out of camps. I'm gonna be their mentor. We got a case manager for them. And out of all the mentors at Homeboys, like I was the one that got picked. For whatever reason that they saw in me, like this is the one, he's gonna be able to do it, which is great. I'm honored to do it just to help out these kids, man, because uh, we all need some type of guidance, man. A lot of us been misinformed and misguided, and I wanna be that one individual that's like, let me grab your hand, homie, let me walk you through this shit with me, homie. Like, I'm gonna show you what's up. I'm gonna meet you where you're at on a street level, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that there's another way of living, homie. Don't even trip, you know? And it's good, man, it's a good thing.